Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here. My name is Joy Connolly, and as Provost and Senior Vice President, I have the privilege of welcoming, you, welcoming all of you to the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and to tonight's event. I'm especially pleased to welcome our alumni and our friends and colleagues who are part of today's conference, events that preceded tonight, and also those who are watching live stream. The audience is even bigger than the people you see around you. Tonight, we're gathered here to discuss a topic that has become increasing, increasingly relevant, and I would say, in fact, an urgent one, uh, given our current political and social climate. And we're also here to pay tribute to a legendary member of our faculty, Francis Fox Piven. I have a feeling that won't be the only time we have a big round of applause. <laughs> like Francis, many of you here this evening have spent a long time on the front lines in the fight for social justice. And others of you may be newcomers to advocacy, and you may, see your, you may well see yourselves as having joined a new resistance. And certainly many of our alumni, and especially those here with us tonight, trace their path to political activism to Professor Pibben, who's been part of the Graduate Center for 35 years. I imagine too that tonight's other disti others distinguished panelists have inspired many of you to work towards changing the status quo. But regardless of where the roots of your activism lie or how deep they run, we're delighted to have you with us and we welcome you here. The fact that you find yourself here at the Graduate Center at the center of this conversation is no coincidence. Our conference panels earlier today used the themes that animate Friends' work as the platform on which to hold intense and lively conversations about our current political moment. That's what we do here at the Graduate Center. We bring together people from inside and, acad uh, inside and outside academia. It's really our habit. It's baked into our DNA. And we're a place that values local and global impact. I strongly believe, after spending a little over a year here now, having moved from an, another unmentionable institution downtown, <laughs> that no other graduate school in the country takes more seriously its public responsibilities or its mission to advance knowledge for the public good. As our name implies, the Graduate Center is a national leader in graduate education at the master's level and especially the doctoral levels. We're one of the largest PhD granting institutions in the country, and we're especially proud to rank among the country's top 10 institutions in awarding doctorates to students from underrepresented minority groups. We're the home of pioneering research and creative work of Nobel and Guggenheim and Pulitzer winners. Every year, and I think this is the, the, I repeat the statistic everywhere I go, it's one of my favorite numbers uh, in the world. Uh, our doctoral students teach more than 200,000 undergraduates at the City University of New York. That means that the very best of research and learning from the seminar room here at the GC goes into every borough and neighborhood. Before we introduce this evening's panel, I would like to take just a brief moment to recognize those who helped make this event possible tonight. The Graduate Center's Advanced Research Collaborative, the Murphy Institute, New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung New York office, the JCF Hellenia Fund, and former GC Foundation Board Chair Craig Kaplan. I thank them all on your behalf, on our behalf, for their generous support of tonight's and today's programming. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Allison Cole and Professor Lorraine Miniti. Allison is the executive officer of our doctoral program in political science here at the Graduate Center, and she served as the co-organizer of today's conference uh, together with Lorraine. Lorraine is a GC alumna in political science, a former student of Francis, and currently professor of political science at Rutgers. I could say a lot more about their achievements, but I know you're all eager to get on with tonight's discussion. So you're in for a thought-provoking night. I wanna thank you again for coming, so please do enjoy the evening. Thank you. 
So I'm Allison Cole, and I have the honor of chairing the political science department here at the Graduate Center. They call me an executive officer, but I'm just a chair. And this is a program that Francis Fox Piven has played a crucial role in defining for more than three decades. Most of today, for those of you who were able to join us, uh, was spent reflecting on our current political moment through the themes that have animated Piven's scholarship. But before we continue that conversation, Laurie and I both wanted to take a moment just to speak about Francis. About 10 years ago, the pundit Glenn Beck singled out Francis Fox Piven as one of the nine most dangerous people in the world. Now, this was before the term alternative facts had entered our lexicon. <laughs> Back when Fox News claimed that their reporting was fair and balanced, rather than their new, more accurate, and far more disturbing slogan, most watched and most trusted. <laughs> it was a gentler time when uh, the principles of Hollywood spectacle, rather than those of reality TV, governed politics. Despite Beck's victory, there was a modicum of truth to his charge. Frances Fox Piven is indeed a force to be reckoned with. She has devoted her long and distinguished career as a scholar, activist, teacher, and mentor to righting wrongs. Beyond an unwavering commitment to enlarging economic and political rights, this has also meant toppling the mistaken presumptions undergirding orthodoxies in the academy and thereby shaping new fields of study and spurring policy change. In her scholarship, Piven not only identifies how to analyze a problem rightly, but how to address it. More specifically, how to support the victims of injustice to see that they possess the power to enact change. That together, they can, by defining, defying rules and disrupting routines, transform the institutions that govern their lives. And that they can do so, in Piven's words, aggressively, proudly, and even joyfully. That is pretty dangerous stuff. On social media, many claim the title of public intellectual, but Piven is an intellectual activist, which is a difference in kind, not just degree. She never tells us how she knew it all along, though often she did. Instead, her work shows us how and where to look so that we can see for ourselves. In the street, at a protest, in the classroom, even at a department meeting, to say nothing of her numerous books and articles, her reasoning is always analytically precise and her political convictions resolute. She's been honored many times for her courageous activism and groundbreaking scholarship, but I think her interventions begin with the performative power of her prose. Her language is simple, bold, and piercingly sharp, but equally striking is the frequent use of the word we in her texts. Now, it's true, many of her pivotal monographs were co-authored with Richard Clower, but this plural pronoun exceeds their collaboration. It's an expansive we, a we that beckons readers to join in a collective endeavor. In turn, that plural pronoun incites readers to connect with others and to rally to defend those under attack. It invites us all, and we're all students of Piven one way or another, to combine anger with hope and imagination, to turn quiescence into indignation and apathy into conviction. Now, Provost Connolly already thanked our generous supporters, but I also want to thank the many students and staff who helped pull together this event. But most of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Lorraine Minetti, uh, a distinguished graduate of our doctoral program and an important scholar of electoral politics and voting in her own right. The success of this conference is due largely to Lori's tireless and extraordinary work. So please, let's give her a hand. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for being here to share uh, this evening with us. Um, I, I wanted to just say one word, really, about the conference that we've had all day. Uh, Francis retired recently after 35 years of teaching here at the Graduate Center, and you know it's a great achievement and accomplishment, and it should be recognized, but she did not want uh, a kind of memorial. She did not want people um, you know, kind of standing up and just praising her. What she wanted, and this reflects who she is, she wanted to talk about the world the way it is right now, about politics, uh, about what we can do to make the world better, uh, an analysis of how we can do it differently, 
uh, and, and really you know, look, look to the future. So I think that's what we tried to achieve um, today during, during, during the rest of the conference uh, by taking a look at and uh, sort of in, being inspired by uh, some of her many works and the many fields really that she has written about. Um, I only, and in that spirit, I do not want to embarrass her by telling her how much she means to me, how much she means to so many of her students. I simply want to say that she is just a so cool, fabulous, fantastic human being. And I, I am so fortunate uh, that in my life, my life has intertwined with hers for uh, man, many years now. And this was the easiest conference I've ever organized. I used to um, be on the left forum board and that was really crazy. <laughs> uh, this was so easy because I had a happy champion in the, in the chair of the political science department. I don't work here at the Graduate Center. Um, Allison Cole worked as tirelessly as, as I did on this. She deserves an enormous amount of credit. And also, uh, uh, Earl Fleary, who you, I don't know if you've seen him or met him, but he is just fabulous. And he's the administrative officer in, in the department. Um, and before I introduce um, Laura Flanders, who's gonna take over and get to the program, um, I also wanna mention just one other uh, supporter, I don't think it was mentioned before, but um, the New Press, uh, Diane Wachtel and Ellen Adler from the New Press um, have published uh, a, a number of books that Francis has written, but going way back, uh, Francis' association with that press has been very, very important, and they were a supporter also of the conference. So uh, thank all of our supporters. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Okay. So now let me introduce uh, Laura Flanders, who I know ma many of you know, and uh, we're so happy that she was able to moderate. She's, I think she's got to be one of the best uh, journalists, interviewers uh, that I can think of. Uh, her work is showcased on her show, The Laura Flanders Show, um, which is a, um, a weekly show that you can see on the YouTube channel for The Laura Flanders Show, uh, where they talk about politics and in she interviews forward-looking people and people in the arts and people doing things and um, her fairly recent uh, work for Yes Magazine, which I use actually in a course that I teach, uh, is really great. And so we're so happy to have her here and I'm gonna turn it over to her and let her take over with the panel. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Laura is gonna take over, I love that. Uh, this is the insurgency from kind of the left-hand side of the stage. Um, we have had a few insurgencies today already. Um, We've changed the format a little bit for this evening. We're gonna do a conversation. Um, but before we do, I, I do wanna spend a little moment in sort of embarrassing Francis. Is that really off the off limits? I mean, for heaven's sake. We talk about the age of Trump. I'd like to insurgent that very idea because I feel that this is all one long age that we have been in uh, since I first came to this country in the early 80s. And there's some similarities I feel as if uh, I'm experiencing now and then. Um, then it felt like absolutely the worst of times. Margaret Thatcher had just got elected, Ronald Reagan had just got elected, nukes, you name it. We were really in big trouble. Um, on the other hand, once I got here, I saw a different model of, of women in leadership. And I saw women, Barbara as well, Barbara and Francis both inspired me enormously that you could be radical and funny and sexy and in leadership and really overturning apple cart after apple cart in a way that I hope we can aspire to today. Um, Today feels a little bit like one of those moments. Yesterday I was on my way to a radio conference and I pulled out of my pocket, I hadn't worn my jacket for a while, I pulled out of my pocket a flyer. I was feeling pretty cheery, the sun was shining, you know, I was on time for the train, always a plus. And um, it, it, there was this flyer, your community is under attack, you know, and I was like, correct, I know, it is under attack. Um, 
there were more so-called candlelit vigils, really triumphalist, racist, supremacist, threatening marches in Charlottesville this last week. Um, you've got the DACA young people in complete limbo. You've got the Trump administration packing the courts with people who really just do not like women and LGBTQI people, and certainly anything having to do with love. You have a climate catastrophe that has reached the point of no return and looks like there is no turning back. You've got Amazon already responsible for a quarter of all online sales in this country, wanting to now do a supersized purchase of its video and television channel stable. They're buying up television channels all across the country to give them more ways to sell us things, as if supermarkets weren't enough. And you've got the Sinclair, Sinclair Broadcasting takeover of Tribune, the Tribune company that will create a right ideologically driven broadcasting behemoth reaching 75% of US TV viewing audiences. Our communities are under attack. At the same time, I think about what we put on our program, and I'm excited to say that the Laura Flanders Show is back on CUNY TV. I think it started this week. You can um, catch us every week, and we are soon to be a co-production of CUNY TV, of which I am immensely proud. Um, on that program, we say we like to interview. We, it's the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. And we talk to people all across the country every week who are doing something extraordinary. Last week, it was people who are bringing aid person to person from Detroit to um, Puerto Rico. This week, it's people who are also in Detroit connecting meshed internet servers to create their own broadband providers in a place where the big cable companies just don't want to serve the majority people of that city. We have the best and the worst of times, I think, in these moments. And this panel, I think, will be the kind of panel that, unlike the flyer that says your community is under attack and you feel your breath getting a little shallower and your heart racing a little faster and you can't actually think, I think this panel is people, women, notably, who pause, summon us to consider deeply where we come from, how we got here, what is the essential makeup of the company that we are in? What mistakes have we made? What great things have we learned? This is an opportunity, I think, to talk about how not only do we make an insurgency from below, but from below, above, and from both sides of the stage. So I want to introduce people who really know, need no introduction, starting at the far side. Ai Jun Poo is the executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. A frequent guest on The Laura Flanders Show. She's also the author of Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. And I will just say there is a lot more in that book than meets the eye. Kim Crenshaw is a um, bi-tenured faculty member at both UCLA and Columbia. In Columbia, she is the um, director of the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. She's also the founder of the African American Policy Forum and its executive director. <laughs> Barbara Ehrenreich, I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She wrote a book in 2001, um, Nickel and Dimed on Not Getting By in America. I, her list of accomplishments is long. She just wanted me to share with you that she is the founder of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, which if you're not aware of, you really need to check out and you can get more information about it, both at the Institute for Policy Studies and we will make um, more information available to you if you, if you write to us. And Francis is the terribly distinguished professor and public intellectual activist who brings us all here uh, with Richard Cloward. She's the co-author of Regulating the Poor, uh, Poor People's Movements. And I believe the New Press is um, giving away copies of Who's Afraid of Francis Fox Piven, um, <laughs> which will tell you anything you need to know. So let's start. Let's start with you, Ai-jen. I, I come to you for notes of optimism, but in this case, I, I am serious. When we talk about how Francis Fox Piven's work has penetrated the work that each of us do, what's your story? Um, is this working? Okay, great. 
Well, first, I actually have a gift from the members of the National Domestic Workers Alliance to present to Francis for telling the story of how everyday people have changed the course of history in this country. Everyday people like domestic workers. Um, so I just want to present that first. share a story about Francis with you because I think it actually really defines, it gets me out of bed every day. Um, back in 2011, not long after Occupy Wall Street, I had the great uh, privilege of hearing Francis speak to a small group of um, organizers and um, and she said, it was 2011, so it was after Occupy, after the protests in Wisconsin, um, the Dreamers movement, um, and, and she said that what she was seeing was what she thought were early signals of the coming of the next great social movement in this country that would fundamentally update and transform our democracy the way that the civil rights movement had, the way that the labor movement of the 1930s had, um, the kind that only comes around once every few generations, um, the kind where your kids and your grandkids ask you, where were you, right? What were you doing at that time? And, um, and she also said that we would know when it had arrived, when millions of everyday people were in the street in motion. And I was in Washington for the Women's March on January 21st. And yes, <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of you are there. And I just kept thinking of what Francis said that day. I looked around and all I could see were millions of people in every single direction that you could see in the streets. Millions and millions, over four million um, in the United States. And, and I just thought, this could be our moment. Like, this could be it. And I do think that it's not inevitable, but I, but I also think that that is the potential of this moment, and much of it is up to us. I do think there's a real hunger and a demand for a whole new vision for our democracy, and people are in motion. It didn't stop on January 21st, as many of you know. Um, and so that is the opportunity of this moment and that frame, that story that I tell myself every day, I got from Francis. Barbara, to you. Same question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I... I think Francis and I kind of got together in a similar period, that is the Reagan era. And I made a big mistake. I, I put together a collection of essays I had written in that time and called it the worst years of our lives. <laughs> I mean, unless I can do a, you know, a part two. Um, but anyway, it was very, very bad times. and. I, I was like so many people, totally intimidated by Frances and amazed that she thought I was somebody who could be brought into the struggle. I mean, not that I hadn't been active, an activist. So uh, one of the big things we got into right away, or she got me into, was the struggle against welfare reform. And what she said was, you have to start with the most oppressed, the most ground down, and that would be welfare recipients. Now, I've thought about that again and again. Uh, is that true? Um, you know, is that the best way to work? But I, you know, it was very inspiring to me. I am an atheist, not a Christian, 
But if I, my understanding of Christianity is you start with the, you know, you start from the bottom. And anyway, mostly, she's like a great friend, you know? <laughs> Kim, to you. Well, so my story um, goes back more decades than I actually want to acknowledge. Um, I went to law school in the early 80s, and during that period, we were in the midst of perhaps the most um, significant retrenchment since the first Reconstruction on questions of civil rights and race. Um, and when I went to law school, there was the, the, there was the emergence of the left in critical legal studies. And at the same time, the, um, I, I call them the liberal centrists on race, were basically in the position in law schools um, to more or less dictate the terms of engagement around race. Um, and as a young activist coming into this elite space, I was basically torn between these two, um, these, these two political formations. So on the left, there was conversation um, around the critique of rights. There was conversation around the idea that perhaps a rights-based strategy wasn't the best strategy. There were criticisms about the idea that um, people from the bottom were demanding the wrong thing. They were using rights discourse in a way that was inevitably going to undermine their interests in the end. There were pieces of that, that that seemed to ring true, but there still was something missing, it seemed to me, in that analysis. On the other side, there were um, liberal race centrists who were completely um, engaged, committed, they had um, consumed all the Kool-Aid about the role of law in producing racial reform that was sustaining and ongoing and transformative. There seemed to be something kind of there, but something not. So in, I, I was one of many young uh, people of color who were just trying to figure out where's the space for the analysis that makes sense to us. How do we talk about the transformative potential of law, but also the legitimizing potential of law? How do we talk about the fact that rights allowed people from the bottom to actually have a language to affirm their, 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 their vision of how the, how the world can be, and at the same time talk about how quickly those rights can deteriorate once the insurgency of the moment has basically been taken over by the idea of we've, we've given you what you need and now go away. Um, and so I was trying to write about this stuff, trying to have debates about the critique of rights, trying to write about what, what it means to have been someone who was empowered by rights, but at the same time realizing that there were limitations and then I found I found poor people's movements. I found mm -hmm. the argument. It was it was all right there that um, poor people can challenge the conditions of their lives from the bottom, and at the same time, elites at the end of the day um, determine what poor people get in response to that. So, you know, it was an answer to say, look, it didn't matter what the language was gonna be that poor people, black people um, use, we were still gonna get rights whether we demanded land or something else. Um, and it was also the case that um, the work um, actually informed the title of my first article. It's called Race Reform and Retrenchment transformation and legitimation in, in anti-discrimination law. That would never have been remotely part of my understanding had it not been for my engagement with, um, with Fran's work. So in many ways, I see her work as being one of the unrecognized sources of critical race theory. That work is one of the unrecognized sources of intersectionality. It's work that continues to bear fruit even, even in this period where the question is who has the momentum when we're talking about building from the bottom. Francis. Laura. Uh, how to say this nicely. You're such a great moderator. 
You're such a great steerer of the conversation. Can you please steer it away from me? I'm going there. <laughs> insurgencies, activism. Describe the, sea, the landscape of insurgency as you see it now. Well, I think that the potential for insurgency is always there, uh, and the potential for effective insurgency is always there because the complex institutions of a complex modern society require intricate forms of cooperation from lots of people. If that cooperation ceases, if it stops, things slow down and then they shut down. And that's what I call disruption. That can happen and it often happens at a time when you're in, when observers are, in a sense, the least prepared for it. However, and this is really important because because so many of us are opinion makers. There are also enormous obstacles to the activation of this insurgent power that comes from disobeying, from rule breaking, and from all of the disorder, the ungovernability that flows out of rule breaking. People, I mean, what's, what do we mean by socialization? We mean people as little infants, little puddings that you can shape, uh, shaped into conforming animals, conforming creatures, because they want approval, uh, they want the support and assent and, and affection of those around them who are stronger and so forth. Uh, and then there are, of course, the threats and the incentives that come from conformity. No matter how old you are, you still want approval, you still want a raise, you still want to get your pension. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of ways in which this capacity to be defiant, to break the rules, and by breaking the rules, to activate the elemental power that belongs to all of the cooperating members of a complex society. Uh, if you, you have to break the rules to activate that power. That's what the power is. The power is in stopping things. That's what a strike is. And we can strike in many different ways, in many different institutional contexts. And we mostly don't do it. Mm. We don't do it, other people don't do it. And we don't do it because the forces of conformity are, over, are, are so large, so overpowering, uh, so com comforting as so, well. So let me ask Igen, is it possible that the insurgency that you, that Fran was describing that you think about in this moment is the insurgency of rule breaking and disruption and putting shaping from the right? From the right. Mm -hmm. They claim that they're the great disruptors. The Trump especially, his supporters believe that he is the great disruptor. That's what they, literally those words you heard at the Republican convention last year. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a way that that's true, right? Um, and that there is a way that the core moral fabric and the institutions of our democracy are being threatened and disrupted in pretty existential ways right now, um, for sure. And I think that I agree we don't wield disruptive power enough. Um, and I do think that that's something we need to be wielding more. Um, I think that there's a lot of complex dynamics happening. Um, and you know, one of the things that was, I think, so powerful about the movement for Black Lives, from Black Lives Matter, was its incredible disruptive power and is its incredible disruptive power. I mean, just when Fran was saying that, um, 
the first thing that came to mind was a recent direct action in front of, uh, in, in LA County, where they were gonna build new prisons, right? Some thousands of new prison beds and the local Black Lives Matter uh, chapter actually organized a disobedience, civil disobedience action where they actually brought 2,000 beds to block the state house and actually chained themselves to the bed and disrupted the, the business as usual in the state house. And I think that that kind of activity is absolutely essential in this moment. And I think it has to be combined with wielding other forms of power like political power and the power to, you know, uh, unelect people, um, <laughs> and narrative power. The ability, I mean, you're the pro at this in terms of how we actually build the power to tell the story of um, who we are as a country on our terms. If, if Barbara? I may, yeah, if I, I, we don't have to just keep going in order when you call on us. Let's Not at a all. Little <laughs> Disruptive. Right Disrupt. <laughs> because I, I think, you know, Francis, People have a sense that the rules are being broken all the time from above. You know, that everything, when you said the word pension for a moment, I cringed. What's that? You know, maybe we have a generation gap here. <laughs> pension. I mean, some of you may know about them, but I, not in my life. Um, but, you know, things are being destroyed so rapidly from basic notions of courtesy and decorum to any kind of uh, you know social program that has ever helped people is being you know I'm just you, I don't have to describe what's going on. There is an anger and there is a ripping apart and this the energy of that kind of insurgency against a technocratic government that well we could, I'm not going to analyze the Trump victory here, but. It was an attraction to what was seen as an insurgency, an attraction that was, you know, I'm not gonna also analyze the um, social basis of uh, Trumpism and, it, and the votes for him. But it, certain, it was coming from a variety of people, including some very wealthy people. But it also, it's true, I say with great personal shame, comes in part from the white working class in this country, which is my class of origin. Uh, the, my extended family, it's, it's people who show up at Thanksgiving, it's, it's all that kind of thing. It's large networks of people around, around the country. Now, those that I am blood relatives, none of them voted for Trump. But there is, an, there is something that it was attractive about him to people who have every right to be insurgents on our, uh, on our side or with us, because I think there are gonna be a few things to work out probably. But Trump was a great middle finger in the face of the kind of liberalism, if you could call it that, represented by the Clintons, both of them. Let me bring you into this. It had an insurgent. Let me bring you into this, Kim, because the first that many of us saw of that insurgency was as soon as Barack Obama was elected, um, as we saw the Tea Party movement take to the streets. Mm -hmm. How do you think of this language of insurgency and activism in the Trump era? Um, so I clearly see that, that the insurgency was, um, particularly as uh, articulated by the Tea Party, um, was an insurgency against a perception uh, of an illegitimate president, a perception of having lost out, a perception of diminished overrepresentation. Um, that, that's, a, that's a phrase that my colleague Luke Harris uh, uses to talk about all of the backlash politics against race and gender justice interventions. Namely, these are battles over the diminishment of the overrepresentation of white men, cisgendered, straight people in power everywhere. So, so you have these perceptions of loss that create a counter response. That to me is, is really not, um, uh, it's, not the, it's not the full part of the story because you know, we've had retrenchment moments in the past too. It's not just the, the impulse 
um, is not just the, the backlash, it's the softening of the resolve against the backlash. It's the tying of the hands, the inability to speak it, the inability to analyze it, the inability to be insurgent against it. Mm. So, so when the Tea Party came online, when the disrespect of the president happened, when, um, when Black Lives Matter came online, the, the center, and I would also say some, um, some parts of the left were unable to respond to this with the language that tied this to historical moments of race retrenchment in the past. Why? It was like um, people took seriously the idea that we were post-racial, which was a wink, wink. We know we're not really post-racial, but it means that we can't talk about race. We can't um, understand the structural institutional dimensions that have largely been continuous over the last part of the 20th century into this moment. And even our president, when he says that, you know, arresting Skip Gates in his own home was stupid, um, ends up being so completely um, silenced by that that we don't see him again talking about race to the second part of his term and even then when he talks about it he's talking about it pretty much in the same way that Moynihan talked about it so th so the great you know transition and this idea that we've arrived actually meant that we wound up back in 1965 in the way in which race could legitimately be talked about. So I, I see our reaction as a condition of possibility, the inability to actually talk about what has happened, to talk about it in class and race terms, and not talk about it as there's a race conversation, a gender conversation, a class conversation. Mm -hmm. That is what I think has undermined our ability to think about how to move in this particular. But, but I want to bring so, iGen back in on this, but I want to tell or encourage the audience to um, raise questions on cards. We're going to distribute in index cards. I think they're being distributed right now. Now is your moment to scribble down in legible writing your um, questions of this august group. Um, Barbara, did you want to say something yeah. and then I, Jim? Yes, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let somebody else talk, I will. Um, the trouble with having that kind of conversation is that it, they're so intertwined. One of the great comforting things about being a white person in the professional managerial class, which most of us are, or, or retired from. But people who've been in desk jobs have been telling other people what to do, what to read, what, et cetera. Um, the great privileges of being in that class as a white person is you can project your own racism and all racism onto the white working class. And that's what's been done. There is great satisfaction in the contempt people of the professional man uh, managerial class feel toward the white working class because it's proof of how unracist they are. Well, fine, but now we have to start, you know, we have to connect that gap. And I know you don't start those conversations, of course, with a white working class person by saying, you're a racist. It doesn't go anywhere from there, let me tell you. So uh, we have to understand how tangled uh, this has become, and part of that means confronting the prejudice in people like ourselves, and I speak here as people who are educated, professionals, et cetera, and particularly those who are white. Mm. Ijen, how do you do this work? I'll say two things. Um, one is that I've been really inspired by a lot of white organizers who are actually from rural and small town America who've been organizing in communities of color and urban areas who after the elections went back home to organize their people. And um, it's a, actually a real thing. It's a trend that started happening and I think that that is the kind of organizing that we really need to be supporting and doing so in partnership with organizing in communities of color. Um, and modeling the kind of multiracial democracy that we want at the other end of this, right? Um, and the other thing I'll say is that one of the most important things about the Women's March to me was, for those of you who were there in DC, you'll know this, I mean, not, not even thinking about what was happening on the stage, 
What was happening on this street was that every single person made their own sign. And it was about everything under the sun. And they were way smarter signs and more, way more interesting than any activist sign, like, like any sign that somebody like me could have made. But they were about every single issue under the sun. It was everything from education to reproductive rights and justice to health care to immigration to transgender rights. Um, it was, and there was room for all of it. It actually didn't feel like you sometimes do feel in progressive movements where there's a hierarchy of issue or constituency or it actually felt like there was room for all of it. And there was a vibrancy and a way that that felt organic mm -hmm. that was incredibly powerful. Now, what Kim and I did that night was we actually did a town hall meeting for that was specifically targeted to people who were coming, and Ellen was there too, Ellen Bravo, who were coming to the march for the first time, like really not having been active before as a way of connecting new marchers, right, new people to the move, newcomers to the movement, to women's organizations, women of color, working class women's organizations who are in motion on winning on real issues like paid sick days and paid family leave, um, people who are working on immigration, right, all kinds of issues, so that they could actually get connected to what it means to organize, what it means to win, what it means to be in motion together in a deeper way. And so I'm, I'm saying, I guess I'm saying that the fact that we have a movement moment and a context where we can be in motion together, and we can actually choose to create contexts where there's room for there isn't a hierarchy of issue or agenda. And then in that context, we can have deeper conversations about race and class and all the things that we actually need to talk about, right? That I think that that's kind of, that's some of what needs to happen. So the, it is also true that we went home, that we didn't make demands. As soon as the administration took office, we were already home. Those hallways of power, corridors of power, were suddenly occupied only by lobbyists, not ours. So I guess my question is, yes, we need the movement internal work, but we are in a crisis. We also need the external work, the power creation and deploying, de deployment. Um, who wants to address that? How do we go that next step? What are the pieces we need or the lessons we need to learn? to take that next step well, to power. Uh, the, here's, here's my, the, this is the core of what I was gonna get, say if, tonight if I was giving a, a, a speech. And I'll take, pick up on Ajahn's optimistic note about the number of new people who have come into the resistance. Uh, we can all name some in our own households. Uh, but one of the things that worries me very much is that there are some deep divisions and I'm, I'm beginning to discover that they are class divisions. Uh, among, within the resistance, for example, um, there are white working class people, more than you would probably think if you just read the paper. For example, it's seldom point out, pointed out that the woman who was killed in Charlottesville was a white working class woman. Heather Heyer. She, yeah, Heather Heyer, a uh, paralegal who did not even have a college education, but learned to do the, the office stuff in a legal office and also worked as a waitress. Heart, did you remember any mention of that? Because the white working class has been so demonized at this point. Then, another thing that really became very clear in Charlottesville is that there are groups Blue collar groups like Redneck Revolt. You heard of it? This is, okay, rural, I imagine mostly white group, uh, that goes to demonstrations, goes to places like Charlottesville with guns. They go ready to, to shoot if they have to uh, defend their side. I've heard a rumor that the slogan is put the red back in redneck, is that? Yes, put the red back in redneck, I love that. Then the other uh, thing I want to uh, mention and I know this is going to be somewhat controversial, 
because there's a lot of controversy about it, is Antifa, or Antifa, depending where you live in this country. The anti-fascists who go masked into demonstrations. Why are they masked? They do not want to be identified. They are really hard for journalists like me to sit down with and talk to. I began to get some inklings of, a, of it being a more working class I mean, it's not Princeton graduates behind those kerchiefs or undergrads or anything, really. Uh, there was a good article in Mother Jones in August about solid blue collar mm. basis of Antifa. Then I will just finish with this personal thing that, that just happened to me a few days ago. I was talking to a friend. I said I had this like extended family of friends who are a uh, working class. And I was telling him that I was just sort of mystified by who the Antifa people are. Now, that's insurgent. That's very insurgent, these people. And the person I was talking to, a member of this extended family of mine, started to <clears throat> clear his throat a little bit, and he said, I'm one of them. I had no idea, because they don't talk about it. And what that meant is that he is part of a phone tree. They do not use the internet, they do not use cell phones to communicate. Mm -hmm. But you can get a phone call saying, come somewhere because uh, a, a person of color is going to be harassed, or because there's some, somebody who needs defending. And through this kind of clandestine network, they will come together. Francis, uh, do you want to come in on this? Huh? Did you want to come in on I this? Did. I did, because I think uh, as soon as we start talking about uh, the, the current regime in a way that refers back to the election, the November election, uh, we start searching for singular answers. And I think it's, in fact, a little complicated. And the first level on which it's complicated is that a, Trump did not win the popular vote. Uh, B, uh, his technical victory was the result of an anti-democratic provision in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so, in, not very, it didn't, in a certain sense, we're explaining something that didn't happen. We're explaining a majority uh, rejection of the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. However, I think there are good reasons. There were good reasons for uh, white, middle, and working-class people to reject the Democratic Party and the Obama administration, which had not been speaking to their basic concerns for some time at the very least since the emergence of the Democratic Leadership Council, but I think long before that. So it's complicated in that sense. Well, it's also complicated in the sense that Trump voters are not exactly who we're talking about. We're talking about the wor white working class, and we talk about people who are experiencing intensified hardship and the resentment that well, let me let me but, bring. But Trump voters were not that part of the working class. Hmm. They were the better off among the working well, class. Well, that's why I wanted to bring Kim back in because it does seem like nobody has been served less well by the Democratic establishment um, than black women. Yeah. And yet, black women at the very bottom of the yeah. class totem pole um, supported Hillary Clinton in the largest demographic. That she had. Yeah. So, so th that. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to to begin with. So, <laughs> you know. I, so, I just want to pause and, and note for a moment that our very attempt right now to figure out how to talk about race, class, and gender is difficult um, because we've we've all sort of taken off with a certain understanding of what the initial conversation is about about how race played out. Um, so we've talked about recognizing that the white working class was not monolithically behind Trump, which of course that's true and nobody said that was the case. It's also the case that um, 
uh, race did have a lot to do. It does, it's not exclusive. So we have to be able to be able to talk about race without saying or inferring that we're saying that it's all about race. And we also have to be able to talk about hardship without the assertion of hardship being taken as an excuse or justification for um, a racist populist movement. If, if hardship explained this vote, African American women would not have been voting 96% for the Democratic Party. No one lost more economically over the last eight years than African American women. African American women ha have a median net wealth of $5. African American women are, 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 the, are the group that has shown the least amount of being reintegrated into the economy. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So if it was just a matter of hardship being overlooked, being forgotten, not being uh, hailed, not being called out, then it would have been African American women. The fact that it wasn't is telling us that there is something both more that was going on that, that generally this argument doesn't take up, but what I'm mostly concerned about is what's happening now. Mm. So whatever we think happened, one of the things that seems to be happening in mainstream and progressive discourse is we've got to figure out how to come up with a framework, a way of mobilizing voters that we've lost that doesn't involve using hot button issues or language that turns them off. And what that means is that our, our most loyal constituency, our core, the people who are willing and able to resist, resist all the scapegoat politics, they're basically being um, pushed out of the conversation. So we've got to figure out how to have this conversation with, without it prompting or a sense of we are leaving people out. We have to have a conversation that allows us to talk about the race, class, and gender dimensions of all of this. So it, number one, it has to be intersectional. When we talk about class, and we're not talking about women of color, then that's not talking about class. Mm -hmm. And we gotta figure out how to do that. So I, Jen, I'm gonna come to you in just a second to talk about care. How do we exercise care in our next steps? But before we move off hardship, I want to contribute another aspect, another lens, um, and that's colonialism. And I happen to have a, a, call, a call come in this morning um, from a friend. Good evening, everybody. This is Rosa Clemente reporting live from San Juan, Puerto Rico. First and foremost, I want to send all my love and thanks to Frances Fox Piven and everything she has done for people on the ground and showing us how to do the work from the bottom up. I just wanted to let people know the dire situation in Puerto Rico. I landed here Sunday with an intergenerational delegation of all Latinx, Latina, Latino youth media makers. We've been here since Friday and we'll be here till this coming Sunday. Whatever is being told by the mainstream press and unfortunately even of some of our friends in the progressive or left press is not telling the full magnitude of what is happening in Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans do not need donations and supplies. There are thousands of containers on the port that have not been distributed to people. There are people who unfortunately are feeding their babies at this point with mashed up bananas because there is no baby food. FEMA has abandoned Puerto Rico. The military has occupied our island once again. Yesterday, we were able to go to Utuado, one of the worst hit areas in Puerto Rico, and we did see military there, and they were occupying a town. And we asked them, why are you not going to people on the mountain? And they said they didn't have the means to get there. But we were able to get there in a Honda accent, four of us and get to the bottom of the mountain. There are people who have now been there 21 days without the diabetic medication, without water. Puerto Rico is still 90% without electricity, and most, if anything, happening is happening in the San Juan district. 
Five mayors are being investigated as of today, including Mayor of San Juan, from what we are hearing, for withholding supplies to the people of Puerto Rico. People are asking, where is the insurgency from Puerto Ricans? The insurgency is Puerto Ricans helping themselves because everyone, unfortunately, including our friends all over the world, our organizers and comrades have abandoned the people of Puerto Rico. People do not have water, and where we also see military the most, is guarding stores like Sam's Club and Walmart. There are no points of distribution in any of the 77 other municipalities in Puerto Rico. People are bathing in river water that is toxic, and I can go on and on. But the sounds of Puerto Rico are no longer the coqui. The sounds of Puerto Rico are sleeping at night to generators, waking up to military helicopters. We are on the ground and will continue to report. We implore you, if you can, to send any type of donation to us so that we could be reporting the truth. When we went to the press convention... What she goes on to say is she goes to the press center and she is at that moment the only um, press from the United States there. Uh, and we'll put the rest of the audio on our website. If you follow Rosa Clemente's Facebook page or the Laura Flanders Show page, we'll bring you her reporting. Um, not to derail the conversation we've had so far, but to simply add to it. I, Jen, I look to you. You and your colleagues deal with people in life and death situations every day uh, at an intimate level you figure out, as the domestic workers, how to deal with power across traditional power imbalances of the, the client and the, the employee. Uh, you deal with the state. Um, you are now very involved in the organizing that has followed the Women's March on Washington. Given everything that we've heard, you deal with race, class, gender, all of it all the time. What have you learned? What is, what is it that we can learn from the domestic workers and those you work with to apply in this moment so that our activism goes beyond activism to power? In 30 seconds, I'll, no, just <laughs> I have to say I'm really just heartbroken about the situation in Puerto Rico. Yeah. I, I want to to say one more thing, and since there's a moment of silence, I will say it. Um, and that has to do with the urgency of this moment. It, he, yeah, I, I it's hope the whole thing falls apart pretty soon, the Trump thing. But what has been unleashed is really fascist forces in this country. I don't live in New York, in New York City. I live in Virginia, uh, not far from Charlottesville, and then only a few blocks from where I live, the Nazi, and uh, that is a fair description, um, what's his name, the white supremacist Nazi guy? Yeah, he opened an office on the main street of our town. They, there is a threat. When people like Cornel West and people, pe people of real people deeply of peace can go march in Charlottesville against racism and be attacked by fascists, Nazis. That's scary. That's why we have to take seriously that this is not just any old moment. This is what I hear from the young people who are drawn to the resistance, is they don't want to hear all of our cogitations. If they'll fight, and they're ready to fight, and that's, that's like a whole political issue. Do you punch a Nazi? I don't have an answer. I wouldn't perhaps share it here. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think there is a sense uh, of something extreme mm. going on right now. And what's grown in our faces every time we say, well, slow down, we have to you know, build this majority and everything, somebody will throw the Weimar Republic in our faces. Ai-jen? 
It's because you care. <laughs> Um, well, I think we have to build the most powerful opposition movement the world has ever seen. And I think that it has to be, it has to be working on multiple time horizons. There is the immediate work of fighting and fighting back and pushing back and showing up for each other. Um, and there is the work we have to do to organize and build power. We have to electoralize the anger and frustration and fear that's out there into real electoral power. Um, and we have to build the capacity of our organizations to represent communities like women of color who are the backbone of our democracy and have never been supported to actually have any real political infrastructure and capacity, right? So there's a lot of work that has to happen on multiple time horizons and more people have to be thinking about what to do from a movement-wide level, right? I mean, we're organized by issues and constituencies and we each care about different things and we focus on different things. Well, this is a moment where we actually have to really come together. And, and the thing about this opposition movement that we're building, it, it, it can't just be about opposition. It also has to be about what we're proposing. What is our vision for a multiracial democracy in this country that actually supports opportunity and dignity for every person in this country? And we have to have real ideas. And I think one of the things we're trying to do in the domestic workers movement is propose a vision for care right, for child care, elder care, and paid family leave that lifts up the predominantly women of color and immigrant women who've been doing this work forever and resources families to be able to afford the care they need to take care of their families, both and a vision for a way forward that actually does make it real for people why they should join our movement. Mm. I want to ask a group conscience here. We want to leave time for Francis to wrap up. I, I have three questions. I'm kind of inclined to let our panelists share some closing thoughts. With those who posed these questions, forgive me. One has to do with precarious workers right here at CUNY. Another one has to do with how do we do this um, at the bottom um, organizing to take power. And a, a third one has to do with um, transforming the Democratic Party. If I could take your <laughs> generosity to just throw it out there, and if people want to address those, that would be great. But I really do want to hear from Kim and Barbara, and then we'll get a chance to hear from Francis. Some, some closing thoughts here in a moment where, as Naomi Klein puts it, we could have shock doctrine one way, or we could have shock doctrine the other. I try to focus on our program on how into the vacuum of corporate and political fail all across our country, people who've been failed are moving. And they are moving with alternatives that speak to their needs in whole different ways, whether it's political or in the workplace or in the home or at the level of their community. I think there is possibility here, and they'll say it even around Puerto Rico. We could either protect Walmart and the fossil fuel economy, or we could support a people's revitalized, newly vital Puerto Rico with more solar and wind power than you can imagine and independence to make their own decisions. I think we have opportunity. <laughs> Who wants to speak to it? Barbara, do you want to say a word? Kim? Do you want to give a final word, a final thought before we turn over About to Puerto Francis? Rico? No, whatever you would like on how no, we... because it just seems... To Flashing through my mind right now was there are so many American workers of any color who don't make enough money or don't have jobs who would, can you imagine if the United States was able to pay them to go and exercise their skills in Puerto Rico? How that would change the whole picture on, on, on race and uh, white nationalism and all of this stuff. Because we could take pride in that. We could feel that sense of community. But as a community doing things, caring, I will even use 
AI <laughs> Jen's lovely world. But I, I do say, I do think we need vision, but I do want some way of answering people who say, don't you realize, you know, we don't have that much time in this country or the world doesn't have that much time mm -hmm. to dither. And I'm gonna just leave you with that. Um, I'm not gonna be leading the troops in the streets, but um, it, you know, to me it is the time we need Francis more than ever. And it may be, well certainly these other women, even me, you and I may be getting old. No? no? Uh. Kim. You know, I feel so many of these, these moments are reminders of conversations that we started to have that didn't. So, um, you know, Kanye has done a lot of crazy things, but the one thing that he said that still rings in my head when I hear, when, when he said after Hurricane Katrina, he told the truth. George Bush doesn't care about black people. And, and now, now we're in this moment. We cannot be shocked or surprised um, about what's happened because it happened before. Nothing really happened that changed that. We didn't have a, a, a society-wide accounting of the fact that people were left to die you know, in New Orleans, and now the same thing is happening in, in Katrina. So there, there's at least something about this moment that I want to think makes us grapple with the hard stuff on our own team that we've not been able to deal with. I want to think that. Um, I'm not sure that it's actually happening. So when, when, I, when I'm listening to what foundations are saying, when I'm listening to what pseudo progressives like, like Mark Leela are saying, when I'm, when I'm listening to people who are saying the problem was we were too concerned about social justice, too concerned about anti-racism, too concerned about feminism, too concerned about queer people, that's why we got ourselves here. And so we have to turn the corner and move away from that. And I don't hear, millions of people saying, hell no, that's what we need more of moving forward. When I don't hear that, I start getting worried. The piece of it that does make me somewhat hopeful, um, and this, this builds off of, of Fran's work, the, the idea about insurgency from the bottom means that people have to cast their gaze upward in understanding where the conditions that they're living in have come from. What is not part of our conversation and just hasn't been is the massive distribution of wealth upward. So, so people are looking across and down to stabilize themselves. And while that's happening, they're not seeing the massive theft that's going on upward. So, so I, I, I wanna take the idea of insurgency from the bottom and attach to it the implicit part of it, which means you have to have a sense of where you are, and you have to have a sense of who you are relative to those who, you know, not just the 1% now, but the 1% of the 1%. We've got to have that as part of our common conversation if we're talking about building out this moment trying to institutionalize a different way of thinking about politics. That's got to happen now by shifting our mm. gaze. And Ooh. that's one way to bring in the white working class that have, has been alienated. And I would simply add, we have to have a place to have that conversation that is not owned and determined by for-profit corporations like Amazon and Walmart and people who are directly invested in maintaining the status quo. I'm just saying, a public media infrastructure, might it be a good idea? <laughs> Ijen, do you have a final comment and then we'll come to Fran? Um, we could also take over the City University of New York. <laughs> and York um, a place of forum, a place of dialogue for the people of New York City. And in the process, do something about the persistence of contingent precarious work at the City University Thank of you. New York.
Um, I guess I'll just keep playing my optimistic role here on this panel and say that I do feel um, really inspired by the ways in which uh, people are activated. I mean, it's really an organizer's dream right now to see how much people want to show up and organize, and especially women. Women are on fire right now, and I think that it didn't just stop on January 21st. People have been organizing in communities that have no progressive organizations for miles, and coming together and showing up, and, and new organizations like Indivisible showing up for immigrant rights and for racial justice, and there are ways that people are showing up in this moment that actually are objectively quite hopeful. And you, 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 didn't, you didn't even say Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Fran. Are, is this, are these my closing remarks, Laura? You are issuing us out into the insurgency. Okay. <laughs> Never well, closing. I don't listen, like to think of you as closing. This is a very strange moment in American politics and world politics. It is, in a way, a bizarre moment. You talk with your hands, so let me make it easier for you. Oh, yeah. I do. I do. Well, I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> uh, it would be a comedic moment. We would all be laughing if it weren't all so horrible and so filled with potential danger, where the guy in charge is an imbecile and <laughs> deeply deranged, and he has opened the doors of the federal government, thrown them wide open, they've always been partly open, to the fossil fuel industry and to finance. Those are the two big Find economic interest groups that are going to be running the country unless we do our part. Now there's a problem in doing our part and that is that the really highfalutin intellectuals who I love to read because they are so elegant, so well educated and so forth, are kind of in an end times mood or mode. Uh, I mean, these people are, Wolfgang's streak is brilliant. Buying time is a brilliant book. We could go, the state of exception really does cast light on our current situation. Uh, however, I don't think it's end times. I think it's gonna get hotter. It's gonna get muddier. It's gonna, the air is gonna stink. But I think the human race has some time left. And the planet has some time left. And the question therefore emerges about the possibility of restoring a measure of democracy, of collective re self-regulation of uh, uh, especially ecological regulation. Can we do that? Can we restore a democratic society or actually create a democratic society because it wasn't so democratic in the first place? And if we, what is our role in that? And here I think it's very important that we don't take advantage of our sophistication to go around spouting gloom and doom. Truth is, we don't know. Think of all we don't know. Think of our uncertainty. And uncertainty doesn't pre prevent us from sort of oh, sliding back on the sofa and tearing our hair and pontificating about how terrible everything is and how it's all gonna get worse. I think it's not gonna get worse because we can make it better. You know, we really do have power. We just don't use that power. 
In order to use that power, we have to shut our ears to the gloom and doomsters because they don't know anything. They're just talking. Uh, it's, it's easy to talk gloom and doom and to do it in very fancy ways. We, so we have to help people discover their own sources of power, which stem from the roles that they play in major institutions in the United States and in the world. And you know, never have ordinary people had more potential power, because never have the interconnections which bind us together and which make them dependent on us. Never have they been more far-reaching, more intricate, more delicate, more fragile. We can shut it down, and we ought to experiment in shutting it down continually. And when we shut it down here, it won't only shut down here, it will shut down across the globe. The tentacles of disruption will reach across the globe and it will reach, as Steve Lerner was suggesting to earlier today, it will reach to the very top of our society as well. We are the agents that can transform our society and preserve it from the disasters that menace it. So that's my closing message. I want to thank you all. I'm so grateful for all of you who came. I'm so grateful to my students, former students. I'm so grateful to Allison Cole and my dear friend Lori Minetti and the other people who, Barbara who came from Washington, even though it's hard for her to do that now, for iGen I and Kim, Kimberly, who is my next door neighbor, and we're gonna hang out together more. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for coming, and go out there and be tough. All right.